Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Norma Shippen from the Central Legal Office and my colleague, Michael Stewart, who is the team leader for Greater Glasgow and Clyde is also here today. And he's going to tell you about some of the up-to-date cases that have arisen since Montgomery. So he, he's going to be the person that will answer all the questions at the end when they arise. Uh, I should also say that, let me put myself in a bit of context, I play the cello. Um, I, also, I also play the guitar and I sing, um, however not all at the same time and not at all this afternoon. Um, I also have to say that one of the times before when I was doing a talk about informed consent, I uh, turned up without my presentation as I did today, but I had a floppy disk that time, so I handed it to the chap who was running the, the AV and he loaded it up. And as I got up to speak, quite honestly, on the screen behind me appeared the fateful words, Roderick Shippen, death of a salesman. Mm -hmm. I'd picked up my son's English homework by mistake. <laughs> so you don't, you don't have any reason to think of me as being anything other than a perfectly ordinary person who is doing my best to share uh, my knowledge of, of the, the duty to warn and advise. We don't call it informed consent uh, deliberately. We call it the duty to inform and advise. So, was it a paradigm shift? So what's the context of all of this? Um, I don't know if you read the daily record or the papers. I make it my practice to avoid reading the papers if I possibly can. But one of the things that we frequently read in the press is things that have gone wrong in hospitals, isn't it? And the, and the thing that this does, I think, is create a culture of uncertainty, both for the people who are coming in to be treated in your hospital, but also probably for you. So I think this is the context that I, that I think is important, how people view the NHS and how people view the culture within the NHS. And I think it's definitely the case that there is a growing sense that individual patients need to have autonomy. Autonomy is what you hear. Autonomy is the word that people use, and Lady Hale used that word herself. My father recently had a, a hernia operation. He was 92 when he had the operation, and he and I had a discussion about what he'd been told. And what he said to me was, I've been told I might die. I've been told I might have a stroke. I've been told that all sorts of terrible things might happen to me, but it's my choice. He said, I don't want it to be my choice. I just want someone to tell me what to do. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective uh, because that's, I think, possibly what you come across far more frequently than the Lady Hales of the world. But what we want to look at, I guess, is, is keeping a kind of open mind on this and looking at what does the law say about consent, both in general terms in Montgomery, looking at how Montgomery has developed and then looking at how you can approach this in your day-to-day -day work. I know you'll have lots and lots of questions about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a basic uh, potted version of what the law of consent is. Michael's going to bring us up to date with recent cases. And then we're going to open it to the floor. And we're going to have a, an opportunity to talk through some of these issues. We don't have the answers to all the questions that may arise. Because a lot of this will have to be worked out in the days and years and months that lie ahead. But what we can do is start the conversation and tell you what we think may be a reasonable approach. So the first slide is what consent has been defined as voluntary and continuing acquiescence or agreement to a proposed course of action by a competent person, which may be an examination, a diagnostic investigation or a treatment. And I remember getting a phone call from a surgeon who had a 15 year old boy who was suffering from appendicitis and required an appendicectomy. He was declining to give consent to the procedure and his parents were obviously desperate for him to have the operation. And my legal advice was that as long as he was capable of understanding the nature and consequence of his refusal, that that was a legally valid position for him to take. But my general policy would be to err on the side of life where you possibly could and therefore your decision about whether somebody had or had not that capacity would have to have a fairly high bar. Didn't hear anything more so I phoned to find out what had happened and I was told that he'd had the appendicectomy. So I said that's excellent news, how did you achieve that result? And what I was told was that they had simply withdrawn analgesia. <laughs> <laughs> 
and then he gave his consent to the procedure. So I just got off the phone as quickly as possible because you'd have to question whether that was voluntary, wouldn't you? Uh, you know, what, what is actually, what do you mean by voluntary consent? And that possibly wasn't. But it was a pragmatic solution to a difficult problem and that person is probably still alive today as a result of it. It's always been a right of patients in the NHS to give or withhold consent. And it's also a person's right to do things that we think are incredibly stupid. It's a, it's a legal right to give or withhold consent and it's a basic tenant of healthcare. And as you all know, there are different ways of giving consent and the GMC guidance has got plenty to say about this as well. There's implied consent so that if somebody um, rolls up their sleeve, that's always the, the illustration that's given to, take, to allow you to take their blood pressure, that's implied consent. You don't have to get written consent to every procedure that you carry out. Express consent can either be verbal or written. Now, the difference between verbal and written consent is that verbal consent isn't worth the paper it's not written on. You only have to actually legally have written consent for a relatively limited number of things. Many of them involved in the, uh, um, I was going to say the EFREC, but it's not the EFREC, what do you call it? Fertil fertility field. Uh, so, so there are lots of rules and regulations about written consent in that area. And there are some other areas where you have to have written consent. I think for an abortion you have to have written consent. But for many things, it's a convention to have written consent. And why do we have written consent? Because of the very thing that we were just hearing about earlier on, which is that if you're being asked hand on heart to say what you said to a patient five years ago, and you maybe had 20 other people that day to speak to, what is your memory going to be like of that? It, nobody can say that they can absolutely remember what they said to a patient. And most of the patients that you speak to will not remember either. There'll be a constructed memory often of what people think they wish they had heard or what they think they did hear, but often it's not actually the reality of what happened. And so the, the main reason that you write things down is for evidential reasons. So that later on you can go back and look at it and say, that's what we discussed at the time. And also that can be done by patient information sheets and things like that that you can hand out to people. That can also prove what you told someone at the time. So consent is also supposed to be based on an adequate knowledge of the nature, purpose, likely effects and risks of the full course of action. And the person, this is from the GMC guidance, the person is supposed to receive sufficient information in a way that he or she can understand about the treatment options available, the nature and effect of the clinician's recommended treatment and substantial risks associated with it. So that's, that's taken straight out of the GMC guidance. So then we move on to the case of Montgomery against Lanarkshire Health Board. One of the things that Montgomery made clear was that in an emergency situation, that doesn't change. Montgomery doesn't change anything about emergency situations. You don't technically need consent in an emergency situation. Who can legally consent? Montgomery has a bit to say about, about capacity to consent. And it's one of the things that I normally say a bit about because what I've discovered in the course of my long working life is that many, many people just don't understand the laws of consent. And there are still people out there who think that a wife can consent on behalf of their husband. And I, so that's why I just run through this, just in case there's anybody in this room who maybe still thinks that. Who can legally consent? An adult with capacity can consent. So somebody who's 16 or over can legally consent. An individual authorised by the Adults with Incapacity Act can consent. So that's a welfare attorney or a welfare guardian. Um, a parent of a child under the age of 16 can consent. I've already mentioned children under 16 who can understand the risks. And that's taken from the 1991 Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act. You'll hear people talk about the Gillick test, and that's the English test. But in Scotland, we have it enshrined in, in an Act of Parliament. And the qualified medical practitioner doesn't need to be a doctor. It could also be a, a nurse. So that's what the, what the test is for people under the age of 16. I actually got a, an email last night about a child of 13 who had been uh, admitted to the, one of the hospitals that I deal with for a spinal uh, operation. 
and she had given her agreement to the procedure prior to going into hospital. Her parents had signed the consent form. She was taken into theatre and as they were about to give her uh, her anaesthetic, she said she didn't want them to proceed any further and she did no longer want the operation. So the clinicians in the, in the theatre stopped and didn't proceed with the surgery. She was taken back through to the ward and her parents were very angry. They said, we've given our consent and we think that you should have held her down and given her the general anaesthetic. So the question for me was, what is the legal position? So just in a straw poll, how many people would have held her down and given her the anaesthetic? I think that's the right answer. Uh, so what I said in response to that was, as long as that child was capable of understanding the nature and consequence of that course of action, then she was capable of withholding her consent. And to hold her down and to give her the anaesthetic against her consent would have been an assault. So that was technically the legal position. It probably doesn't help all that much though, does it, to know what the legal position is, because presumably she still requires to have that surgery at some point. It was elective surgery. So it can, presumably they can still have conversations and help her to get over her difficulty with the, the surgery in the future. But that was something that actually happened yesterday about consent. So, what about um, the, here, here we have the, uh, another quotation from the uh, GMC guidance, which is the 2008 guidance. And I'm not going to say anything more about you because you all know that off by heart. So what about somebody who lacks capacity? Well, if somebody lacks capacity to make a decision, then uh, technically you can go with the Adults with Incapacity Act and get a Section 47 form filled out and um, proceed to treat that individual, or if, you, if they've got someone else who can consent on their behalf, that's, that's fine. But sometimes it's not so easy, is it? Sometimes it's not so straightforward, and there's a continuum, isn't there, of from completely not understanding to completely understanding. And it depends really what you're doing along that continuum. So I guess what is important is to document that and make sure that you've got it written down somewhere. And these are the things you're supposed to take into account in weighing that in the balance. So what is the consequence of non-consensual treatment? There's a third consequence that's on the slide that I amended that, that um, hasn't come through here, but which is in fact really important as well. So the first thing that can happen is a civil action for damages. Second thing is criminal liability for assault. That's a highly unlikely event. Um, my husband's a procurator fiscally, works in the Crown Office, and we frequently have discussions. You'll be sad to hear. <laughs> about uh, things like this. And uh, I mean, he, his view is that that's a, a pretty unlikely event in Scotland and it's, it's not something we've been really conscious of it happening. It certainly happens in England more frequently, but it doesn't really happen in, in Scotland so much. But the third thing is what um, Michael was alluding to earlier on, and that is the star chamber of the GMC, which I heard a guy from the MDDUS speaking about this subject as well, and that's what he was saying was the most fearful place that you could be challenged on all of this. And he was saying that anyone who's ever been to the GMC and the way it's laid out, it, it, strikes, it strikes terror in the heart. I've never been to the GMC myself. but So that is a third consequence, I suppose. There's a professional uh, responsibility too. So let's move on to Montgomery. So I don't know what you were doing on the 11th of March 2015. Um, you, you may wonder why I'm asking that and it's simply because that was the day that the Montgomery judgment came out and many of us were sitting around our computer screens, uh, the people that were lucky enough to be in the Supreme Court, um, was not, I wasn't one of the lucky people down in the Supreme Court listening to the judgment being read out, um, but that was when the, the case came out. And I think it's true to say that in a sense nothing changed with Montgomery, but in another sense everything changed with Montgomery, as far as we look at cases. And the reason I say that is because although what the case has really done is continue along a road, which Michael very helpfully took us along earlier on and saves me doing it, from the Sidaway case through to the Pierce case and the other English cases which have developed along this line of jurisprudence already, which have been moving towards that kind of looking at it from the patient side of things test, and in the Sidaway case, there was a continuum even there because there were five judges in the Supreme Court or the House of Lords as it was back in the day. And they went from Lord Scarman's view to Lord Diplock's view and they were completely different views. 
held within a same bench on the Supreme Court. But essentially what the ratio of the case, what the, the way that lawyers viewed that case, in Scotland anyway, was that what Sidaway was doing was still judging what clinicians do against a standard of care. So essentially the Hunter versus Hanley test which says that we judge you against what would a reasonably competent doctor acting with ordinary care have done, that's the standard of care put in a nutshell, and that what you would do with the Sidaway case is what would a reasonably competent doctor acting with ordinary care have told his patient? And when you look at what, the, what that would involve, you would then get an expert in the same field to come along and say, well, I would have told this patient X, Y and Z. And if it's along the lines of what you would have said, then it's very difficult to find you negligent, unless there was one caveat in the Sidaway case, which said that if something was a very substantial, a very material risk, something like 10%, then there would normally be assumed by the court that that person's entitled to be warned of that risk. So the Sidaway case was almost like a, a halfway house. But the way that informed consent cases were always approached in our courts in Scotland was by through the lens of Hunter versus Hanley. Is that fair, Michael? That's what we would do. We'd bring along an expert witness and that's what happened in Montgomery. So the Montgomery case, um, for those of you who live on planet Zog and don't know what the facts are, does anyone not know what the facts are? Will I, will I just run through them quickly? Yeah, I'll run through them quickly. The facts of the Montgomery case are that Mrs. Montgomery was five feet tall. She was uh, having, she was a pregnant, she was diabetic, and it was her first baby. Because of all those risk factors, she was being looked after by the consultant, and she was being monitored by the consultant. Now, Mrs. Montgomery, according to the uh, court record, according to her own evidence, many times asked about the risks of having a bigger baby. Um, but she didn't specifically ask about the risk of shoulder dystocia, which I understand means that the shoulders get jammed on the way out, to put it technically. Um, so and in a diabetic pregnancy, apparently, the, the fat can gather around the shoulders. And so normally the head's a bit, the, this is very, I mean, I'm telling a whole bunch of doctors in a very undoctoral way what this case is about, but essentially it was about the risk of the baby suffering from shoulder dystocia not being delivered. Um, the consultant did not warn Mrs Montgomery of the risk of shoulder dystocia, even although she knew there was a 9 to 10 percent risk of that arising, because in her view the risk of something really serious arising was much, much smaller because of all the procedures that you can do during the, the McRoberts technique being one of them, um, all the things that, that obstetricians can do to enable the delivery to take place mean that the actual risk of harm to the baby or harm to the mother, permanent serious harm to the baby or mother is actually much, much smaller. And her rationale for not telling the lady in this case was that she had done a scan at 36 weeks <coughs> And she didn't think the baby was going to be over four kilograms in weight. She thought the baby was going to be under four kilograms in weight. Her general rule of thumb was if it was going to be 4.5 kilograms in weight, she would offer a cesarean section. With someone of five feet tall, she would offer a cesarean section at four kilograms in weight. And they thought the baby was going to be 3.9 kilograms in weight. Um, so... Uh, when the baby was born, the baby was 4.25 kilograms in weight and actually was born at 38 weeks and five days. So it was actually slightly longer than the 38 weeks which the doctor had anticipated. So it was quite a, it was quite a narrow decision that. But there were, there were experts who would also have done the same thing as this doctor because what they said was that in general terms, if you warned every diabetic mother about the risk of shoulder dystocia, no diabetic person, mother, would ever have a vaginal delivery. And that, in general terms, is not a good thing. That was her rationale, essentially, for why she didn't go into the detail about the, the risks of shoulder dystocia. So the shoulder dystocia, of course, you know, uh, unfolded. And I think uh, the, the symphysis pubis was, was separated and it was, a, it was a hideous process, an absolutely hideous. I think what the doctor said was it was, it was an absolute nightmare scenario and you can just picture it, I'm sure, 
the, the unfolding of the, of the delivery was just awful and the baby was born with very severe brain damage. So the case was then taken to the court and through the, at the court of session, the, the court found in favour of the health board on the basis that the expert evidence supported what the doctor had done. Um, there were two factors in the case. One was about the decision uh, not to go to caesarean section because of the possible uh, changes on the CTG trace. And at the, the court of session, that was the main thing the case was about. The, the issue of consent was, was definitely there, but it wasn't the main thing about the case. When it got to the Court of Appeal, the focus changed. The council changed, actually. It was a different team, a different legal team, took the case to the Court of Appeal. And they focused the whole thing about consent. But still, the judges in the Court of Appeal said, no, we're applying the Sidoway test. And we're applying the Sidoway test to the risk of material harm, not to the risk of shoulder dystocia which we were saying was what we should do. And they found in favour of the health board and then it went to the Supreme Court. And we realised that something was going to happen at the Supreme Court when there was a seven bench judge, seven judge bench uh, in the Supreme Court. Because in order to trump what they did in the Sidaway case, who had five judges, you need to have two more. That's the way it works. So if they want to trump the Montgomery case, they'll have to have nine judges. Um, that's just the way, that's, that's the way it works. And so the Montgomery case, we, we realised when that, we heard that, that there was likely to be a, a change in the law. And in some ways, that was the way the wind was blowing in the English cases anyway. Uh, and also, as we've, as we've seen and heard, the GMC were represented at the Supreme Court and there was, they were able to put their views forward at the Supreme Court. And what they said was that the GMC guidance says that you should warn of all material risks and the, 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 the person should be fully involved in the decision making. So they were saying that actually, uh, so that I think that's one of the other reasons that the Supreme Court felt comfortable in making its decision, because it felt that the GMC guidance was all square with what they were saying in their case. So what did they say? Well, they said a doctor is under duty to take reasonable care to ensure that his or her patient is aware of any material risks involved in any recommended treatment and of any reasonable alternative or variant treatments. One of the, th the things that the Supreme Court um, judges said was that they're conscious of a change in the way that people access information in, in, the, in the present day. And that people are now much better informed. I don't know if you're conscious of that. People may be certainly much better armed. <laughs> Whether they're better informed is another matter, but people come with a lot of information possibly and are able to access a lot of information on the internet and come forward with, with various things that they've read and, and, and been able to source. So, in the context of that, what the court was saying was the paternalistic approach, which is the medical profession know best and will tell you what to do, is not a position that the Supreme Court was keen to endorse. That's probably not a position you'd be keen to endorse either. But that's, what, that's part of the, the thinking, I think, that went into the, the rationale of the judges in the Supreme Court. So this test of materiality is something that's actually become very focused upon. And people wonder, well, how on earth do we decide whether it's a material risk or not? Because essentially what has now happened is if, when you are faced with counselling or giving information to a patient, what the law is now requiring you to do is to look at it from the perspective, or the way the law will look at it is from the perspective of the reasonable patient. So what would that patient expect to be told? And what would be material to that particular pe per patient? And one of the things they also said in Supreme Court cases, that may vary from person to person. So what might be material for one patient may be different to what's material for another patient. I'm not gonna go back over the violin playing footballer who, you know, because, I mean, as I've said before, I mean, these are extreme examples and most people that you come across, the 90% of the people that you come across aren't in that category. But most people have something 
about them that maybe that might be regarded as a material risk. So what the court has said is that when we're making our judgments, we have to do it now from thinking what would be important to the individual, what would that person attach significance to, or what would the doctor reasonably be expected to be aware that that person would attach significance to. And it's likely to reflect a variety of factors besides its magnitude. In the old money, what we used to do was you used to say to the expert witness, what is the percentage risk of that thing going wrong? And usually if it was less than you know, a certain percentage, you say, well, that's fine, we'll, we'll just, you know, that's the, we can defend this. So that the, it's going to be a factor, what the, the material, what the number is, is going to still be a factor, but there may be other factors. So the, occurrence, the effect of the occurrence on the life of the patient, how that individual per person may think of as important, and what other alternatives might be available. It was clear in the Supreme Court judgment that they realise and recognise that there are financial constraints on the NHS and that it's within the context of those financial constraints that we're operating. That was one of the factors they said that they'd taken into account. Because somebody once asked me, well, what if you know there's an excellent treatment in America? Do you have to, do you have to offer that treatment even though you know it's not available in the NHS? So I've thought about that, and I don't think you do because you have to offer what's reasonable within what you can offer within your particular health board. Okay. Now, one of the things that we often also say is that although it's fact sensitive and relevant to the characteristics of the patient, what amounts to material risk is not actually something for you to judge. It's something for the court to judge at a later stage. I know it probably doesn't help you at all. But what the, what the GMC Code of Practice is saying is what you've got to do is treat the person in front of you and enter into a, into a dialogue with that individual and find out what's important to that individual. But it's not actually up to a separate medical person to judge whether that's reasonable or not. It's up to the court to decide whether that's reasonable or not. So that, that is what's changed, in my opinion, really, about the Montgomery case, and that's how it's changed the approach in court. Um, and that's what I'm saying there. That you no longer have to prove, the pursuer no longer has to prove that no doctor of ordinary skill would have failed to have given that advice of acting with ordinary care. And then a patient may decide that she does not wish to know what her risks and options are. That's another thing that the, that the court said. And, and again, it's covered in the GMC code of practice. So if you've got a patient like my father in, in front of you who says, no doctor, I don't want to know what the risks are, just carry on. Then what you're supposed to do there is try and persuade them that they should be being told about the risks. But if they don't want to know about it, it's okay not to tell them as long as you document it. And why do you want to document it? Because in three, four, five years' time, you can be 100% certain that the person who is going to court to, to take action will not remember having said they didn't want to know what the risks were. I'm not cynical about that. Um, I actually do genuinely believe, having done this for 31 years, and you can't believe I could have worked anywhere for 31 years, but I actually genuinely believe that most people who go to court and give a co completely contradictory version of fact to somebody else, there are a proportion of people who are lying. Okay, there are a proportion of people who are lying because they want to get money from the NHS. So we'll put that aside. But there are also a substantial number of people who are not deliberately lying. There are a substantial number of people who genuinely have convinced themselves that what they are saying is actually true. And that, they, they're very difficult to cross-examine those people because they genuinely believe what they're saying is true. I remember, to deviate slightly from the, the, the talk, I remember having a case involving a lady who was having a trial of forceps in theatre uh, because the, um, it was a Keelan's forceps. And so what, we, what the doctor said she did was she elevated the head, twisted and pulled. And what the pursuer said happened was that she pushed the head back into the, uh, the, the pelvis and pulled and damaged the baby's head. So there was an issue about how the, the forceps was carried out. But there was, the, so it all focused on how this was done in theatre. And what the, the, the lady who was delivering the baby said happened was that the obstetrician carried out the forceps delivery from her right hand side. So in other words, 
If you imagine, you know, you're this, the person's lying here. I'm the doctor, like this, carrying out a forceps delivery, rather than carrying the forceps delivery from the head of the, from the... Now, obviously, that was ridiculous. And, you know, it was an easy case in a way to, to, to disprove. Because I think had the obstetrician attempted to do that, she would probably have been marched from the theatre under armed guard by somebody else in the theatre and not allowed to proceed with the, with the... And certainly everybody would have remembered that she'd done that. Her husband also remembered exactly the same thing had happened. Now, was she deliberately lying? It was a long time after the event. I actually don't think she was deliberately lying. I think that she was trying to remember what had happened in a very difficult uh, situation where she was being pushed and pulled. The baby's head was pushed back into the pelvis. And I think what she was remembering was that pushing and pulling, which was taking place from the side after the forceps had failed, when they had to carry out a caesarean section. But to me, it just made it really clear that people genuinely struggle to remember exactly what happened. And that'll be true of doctors as well. Because another thing that, that I've noticed over the years is that it's a very stressful thing giving evidence in a clinical negligence case, especially if it was a terrible thing that happened. And so what you do as a human being is you go in your mind, you go over and over and over something until you get to a place where you can live with it. And then that becomes your version of reality too. So it can be a, it can be a double, double whammy really. You've got the patient and you've got the clinician. And what's the, the thing in the middle that the court can hold on to is very often what's been written down at the time. Unless someone's implying that you've changed it or you know, forged it, which you can't guarantee won't be alleged in the year 2016. But it's definitely better than nothing's been written down at all. Prescription of claims. Why do I mention prescription of claims? Well, simply because um, it can take three years to get into court with a case. And you'll probably, many of you here will have been expert witnesses in cases, and some of you may have been witnesses in cases. You'll know that it can be five years after the event. In the case of a brain damaged baby case, it can be 10, 15 years after the event. In the Montgomery case, the baby was born in 1999. It's a long, long time it took to get that case through the court. And, it become, and getting the evidence is very, very difficult. It's meant to be a hilarious slide, you're not laughing, I think you're all probably asleep. So it, it's difficult, isn't it, to know how much to write down and how much to leave out. But L Lord Maclean, or he of the Vale of Leaven inquiry, um, who used to do a lot of legal work for uh, CLO um, when he was a QC, he was very good in court, Lord Maclean. He said that, he said it's always an uncertain guide to what actually happened to proceed on the basis of what's recorded in the hospital records, frequently are found to be incomplete and unreliable. In better news, Lord Reid said, Hospital records are not maintained by lawyers or for the use of lawyers, which I mean, is a bit of a disappointing perspective <laughs> by Lord Reid. Um, they're maintained for medical purposes, and he didn't think the courts should give encouragement to the development of defensive record keeping, although he was the judge who read out the judgment in the Montgomery case, because he's now in the Supreme Court. Um, so there you are. So what are the practicalities? Well, so to boil it down to the practicalities, because... One of the things that, 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 that is important to note about the Montgomery case, and Michael will say more about this in a minute, is that because of the way the Supreme Court operates, they sort of speak out the law as it always was. So it's not all cases that, that happened since the 1st of March 2015, or the 11th of March 2015, that are, that are relevant here. It's everything that's happened up till the 11th of March 2015 as well. So they'll all be looked at through the lens of Montgomery. So, but the good thing is that because it was always the way the law was meant to be anyway, people should have known to raise the point. And, and if they didn't raise it, it may be that they're, that they're too late to raise it now. But what we've discovered in, our, in the course of our work in the central legal office is there's quite a bit of scurrying about to look to see whether you can raise a Montgomery point in any existing cases. And that's, that's so there'll, there'll be a tranche of cases. The cases that are closed and finished are closed and finished. There are, there are a, a tranche of cases that are still on the go where people may well try and bring in an informed consent or a, a duty to inform and advise point, and they can still do that. For the cases for the future, that's what you can, you can't do anything about those cases now, but what you can do for the future is, 
record whether the person was able to consent, record whether the person declined to have a discussion about risks and options, and if there was a discussion, um, record what the nature and extent of those risks were, the options given and the patient's decision. Now, Michael's going to say stuff about um, what's happened since Montgomery, so I'm not saying anything more about that just now. The Supreme Court referred to the guidelines. You'll know the guidelines and th th they're available for us to, to, to look at. That's my last slide. 